Welcome everyone to History Gone Wilder, part of Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this episode, Longstreet and the rest of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia will push north to defeat the Union Army in the Northern Virginia Campaign. James Longstreet might have won the respect of Robert E. Lee, but he still had many critics. The Richmond Examiner wrote a lengthy article about the Seven Days Campaign, and in the description of the Battle of Glendale or Fraser's Farm, the author, John M. Daniel, wrote that A.P. Hill was in sole command of the troops, making it appear as though Longstreet was nowhere to be found. Longstreet would write a sketch of the battle and have it signed by his aide, Moxley Sorrell, and they submitted it to the Richmond Whig, the examiner's competitor. In it, Longstreet derided Daniel, who had been on Hill's staff, for giving his former commander more credit than he deserved. However, Longstreet did not diminish Hill's role. He wanted to correct the statement that Hill was the commander on the field, when in fact it was himself who commanded his own division and Hill's in the engagement. Hill read Longstreet's article and felt that his own troops were slotted in the description and became angry at his commander. Hill wrote to Lee requesting that he be placed under another commander. When the request passed over Longstreet's desk, he endorsed it, saying respectfully forwarded, if it is convenient to exchange the troops or to exchange the commanders, I see no particular reason why Major General A.P. Hill should not be gratified. Later, Longstreet requested information of Hill's troops through his aide, Moxley Sorrell. When Hill returned it, with a note saying he did not wish to hold further communication with Sorrell, Longstreet became furious at the insubordination. He gave another order to Hill, but it was returned as well. Longstreet would eventually send Sorrell to place Hill under arrest, confined to his camp and vicinity. A series of letters passed between the two men until finally Hill challenged Longstreet to a duel. Before it could come to violence, Lee was able to smooth over the disagreement and then granted Hill his transfer sending Hill and his lot division to Gordonsville to fight under Stonewall Jackson. Jackson and his troops were operating north of Richmond, but Longstreet and his now five divisions were watching McClellan's army, which still sat at Harrison's Landing, protected by nearby gunboats. As the divisions under Longstreet kept an eye on McClellan, they also kept their eyes on playing cards. Poker was played throughout the camps, and as Lee and Longstreet rode through them, Lee asked Longstreet if he could do something about the gambling. Longstreet said he would look into it, but the poker player he was knew that the men would gamble no matter what orders came down the chain of command, so he ultimately did nothing to stop them. To the north, the Union High Command had combined all of the troops in Northern Virginia into one army, the Army of Virginia, commanded by one of Longstreet's West Point roommates, John Pope. Lee had dispatched Jackson to suppress Pope, but realized that Jackson could not do it alone, so Lee brought Longstreet north, boarding trains of the Virginia Central Railroad and speeding off north to link up with Jackson. Most of Longstreet's troops arrived at Gordonsville on the 13th of August. Jackson reported to Longstreet offering him command of all the troops, since he was the senior of the two. Longstreet declined for a couple of reasons. One, Jackson knew the terrain and the situation, and two, Lee would be along shortly, so there was no need for him to take command of Jackson's troops. Lee met with Longstreet and Jackson in Gordonsville, and decided to launch an attack on the flank of the Army of Virginia. Jackson's troops would cross the Rapidan River at Somerville Ford, Longstreet at Raccoon Ford, and Stewart's cavalry at Morton's Ford. The front was wide, and the cavalry had trouble screening the front of each infantry column. So when Longstreet crossed at Raccoon Ford and found no cavalry in his front, he ordered two regiments from Robert Toombs' brigade to picket the road in front of his column. Toombs himself was not with his brigade, he decided to visit the home of his congressional friend who lived in the area. When he returned to his unit, he found the two regiments guarding the ford. Toombs found that Longstreet had issued the order, then sent the two regiments back to camp, remarking that the road could be guarded with an old woman with a broomstick. When Longstreet found out about Toombs' actions, he placed the brigade commander under arrest. When Toombs attempted to contest his arrest, Longstreet sent him to Gordonsville. However, Longstreet liked the Georgian, and when Toombs wrote his commander a letter explaining his actions, Longstreet relented and placed him back in command of his brigade. One of Jeb Stewart's aides was captured during the march, and the orders to Stewart from Lee were captured by Union forces. With this new information, Pope began pulling his army back. From atop Clark's Mountain overlooking the Rapidan and Rappahannock Rivers, Lee and Longstreet watched the blue Union columns marching away from them. Lee turned to Longstreet and said, General, we little thought that the enemy would turn his back upon us this early in the campaign. 
Lee, Longstreet, and Jackson gave chase across the Rapidan and Rappahannock rivers. During the march, Longstreet's troops captured a federal spy. The night before, one of Longstreet's couriers had been shot in the back and killed. The documents from the courier were found on the spy. Longstreet ordered him to be executed. Members of the Kirkwood Rangers of the 7th South Carolina Cavalry, the General's Escort, hanged the spy and buried him beside the road. The chase continued, but with a change in tactics. Lee summoned Jackson to his headquarters. The commanding general wanted to force Pope north to give his own army supplies to live off in the northern Virginia countryside. Therefore, Jackson would march by a circuitous route to cut the supply train and the communications of the Union army near Manassas Junction, forcing Pope to fall back. Jackson did as he was told, while Longstreet engaged with Pope and light skirmishing to hold the Union army in place. With Pope now moving north, Lee presumed it was because he had found out Jackson was now north of his position. Lee now ordered Longstreet north. He could choose his own route and chose Jackson's circuitous route to avoid the Union Army performing any delaying tactics. Lee and Longstreet rode at the head of the column of gray-clad troops with a skirmish line in front to warn them of enemy troops in their front. Union troops put up some resistance at Thoroughfare Gap, but Longstreet pushed them back and reached the east side of the mountain. Gunfire could be heard from the fighting occurring near the first Manassas battlefield that was fought the year previous. Longstreet and Lee arrived near the battlefield in the late morning of August 29th. Jeb Stewart met them to inform the two men of the situation. Jackson wanted Longstreet to link up with his right flank astride the Warrington Turnpike, and that is exactly what Longstreet did. Lee urged him to launch an attack, but Longstreet resisted, saying he wanted a reconnaissance of the area before he sent in his troops. Stewart rode to the southeast and found at least one corps approaching the Confederate right flank. Longstreet personally reconnoitred the ground and used a few of his brigades to engage with federal forces by the evening, but he launched no major assault. That night, Lee met with Longstreet and Jackson and determined that they would wait for Pope to attack them, and when he did, they would trap the Union soldiers in a pincer-like maneuver. On August 30th, Pope attacked Jackson's lines. The time was perfect for Longstreet to launch his assault. As the Union soldiers attacked Jackson, Longstreet let loose his brigades, personally deploying many of them to chase the enemy toward the now famous Henry House Hill. For four hours, Longstreet's men attacked Pope's army. Lee sent orders to Jackson to move out, but Stonewall remained in his defensive position for two hours before moving out, and then he only did so lackadaisically, which allowed Pope to reinforce his troops fighting Longstreet. The attack was a brilliant tactical maneuver, but the slowness of Jackson prevented Lee and Longstreet from capitalizing on the assault. The Union Army of Virginia retreated to the northeast, with Jackson and Longstreet pursuing. The Second Battle of Bull Run ended with the Union sustaining over 13,000 casualties and the Confederacy losing over 8,000. To illustrate the savagery of the fight on August 30th, Longstreet lost about as many men in four hours as Jackson did in two days. <laughs>